Hello, my name is Matthias and welcome to the FPL Scope. Today I'm going to go through my team selection for Game Week 3, but before I look into the team for Game Week 3, we have to look at what happened in Game Week 2 and how I did. And as you can see, I got 57 points, which is normally a pretty good Game Week, but I still got a red arrow because my Game Week 1 was really good. So, so yeah, it was a pretty successful Game Week, in my eyes at least, compared to most other managers. But the same time I'm getting a red arrow which is not ideal I was hoping to get only green arrows until I reached number one in the world but alas it was not to be so, so yeah we're gonna have to wait on being number one in the world we're currently 49 points behind being number one and uh, that's quite a lot and I think it's actually like 45 points behind the best player who hasn't used the chip yet because I think like the second player placed player overall has not used a single chip yet which is crazy so they managed to get like Mitoma March and Buemo Everyone at the same time, uh, perfectly, really. So, so yeah, hat, hats off to whoever's in second. The first place team has used triple captain on Mbwemo last week, which is great for them, I guess, but they already used their triple captaincy, so probably have a little bit of an advantage now compared to everyone else that they're going to lose eventually in the season. But either way, I'm pretty far off number one, but I'm not too far off 100k or even 10k, so looking pretty good so far. I'm pretty happy with my score so far, but... Let's just go through the team from goalkeeper until the final attacker, which is uh, not good, uh, either of those positions. But uh, in goal, we have Matt Turner, who got two points. Sadly conceded against Sheffield United. A really good goal from Gustavo Hammer, from the new player from uh, Sheffield United. But once again, Team Forest looked pretty good defensively and didn't really concede many chances. So, so yeah, I don't mind having Turner for the foreseeable future. It seems like now that Dean Henderson might go to Crystal Palace as well. It might be Sam Johnston who's under threat rather than Matt Turner in goal. So, so yeah, I'm quite happy keeping Turner uh, for now, but could also go with someone like Ariola potentially. But, but yeah, I, I think that would just be a sideways move, as I'll discuss in the Game of 3 transfers. But, yeah, I think the Nottingham Forest backup goalkeeper, or the backup goalkeeper being the Nottingham Forest goalkeeper, which is Turner, is not the worst. My starting goalkeeper is Onana, though, which I'm not 100% happy about but we'll get to that eventually then we have Ben Chilwell who did not have a good game in game week two he was subbed off right after the hour mark against West Ham and uh, West Ham beat Chelsea 3-1 as they usually do at London Stadium usually fun games where West Ham win uh, so yeah that was quite a surprising result and quite a surprising turn of events for Chilwell who was the most hyped player going into game week two but he was subbed early but I don't think that's going to happen quite that often in the future he was subbed off for Caicedo, who was the worst player on the pitch by far. So, so yeah, I think uh, Pochettino has learned his lesson there and, and wants to keep Chilwell playing as that attacking left winger for most part of the game, to be honest. So, yeah, no doubts about Chilwell going for, forward. I think he's he's really good. But luckily, I got eight points from uh, William Saliba. And I say luckily because I was really lucky to be one of the ones that got the news right before the deadline for Game Week 1 that Gabriel was probably going to be benched and Saliba was going to start. And now Saliba outscored Gabriel by 7 points this week and 4 points last week. So he has actually gained an 11-point advantage compared to everyone else with Gabriel. And you also don't have the headache of potentially having to sell Gabriel or if you want to keep Gabriel for Fulham at home, where he might potentially start. Like, I don't have to worry about that at all. I can just have Saliba for now. And, and he's a perfectly good defender to have. Even though he's, he's kind of like meh from 5.0 as he doesn't have that much goal threat and stuff. But getting the two, two bonus points really really nice to see as well and he was pretty close to getting the three bonus points as well so that bodes well for the future in terms of bonus with Saliba and then we have uh, the king himself Purvis Estepinian he is um, just amazing really hasn't gotten a single clean sheet so far but three attacking returns in two matches 11 points this time around just what we expected from Estepinian to be honest like even if it doesn't get clean sheets and he get attacking returns and that's what he's shown last season and he he had more to to go with as well judging from last season like he was kind of underpaid when it came to points last season but this season he has just been on it from from the get-go got quite a lucky assist for uh, for Mitoma the the goal where Mitoma just went all the way by himself and scored but the, the second goal or the the goal for us as well was really well taken after getting the pass from Mitoma as well so those two guys have a really nice connection down the left for Brighton and uh, and yeah if you have them, I think you should just stick with them. I think uh, Brighton players probably still undervalued even this this season because it seems like they are one of the best teams in the league still. So, so yeah, it's going to be interesting to see what happens uh, with Europe and stuff eventually. But but Brighton are a really good team and their assets are are fantastic currently. Then we have the captain of the game week and that is Mo Salah. 
kind of disappointed, I guess, with 10 points or 5 points times 2 as the captain. Uh, I was happy to see Hall on uh, blank because I didn't captain Hall on, but Salah getting only a penalty miss and then scoring the rebound from the penalty, that's it. I mean, I can't really complain. I got I earned some points compared to Holland captain, but I feel like Salah captain could have been so much better, especially seeing as Liverpool won the game 3-1 and both Luis Diaz and Diogo Jota got some nice points. But Salah though still, I, I still think he looks really good. I know a lot of managers that don't have Salah are saying like, oh, he wasn't worth the price. He's not worth it at all. And I kind of disagree. So I'm that's what I'm going to discuss when it comes to the Gaming 3 transfers because originally I was going to sell Salah in Gaming 3, but I don't know about that as of right now so so yeah one of the players that I might sell though instead is Marcus Rashford who only got two points and once again didn't look that impressive at all Man United didn't look good once again they had a pretty good start against uh, Spurs but once the, the game got past well past the first half really they didn't really have much to offer Man United so so yeah not really impressed with Man United so far now Mason Mount has been injured might be a plus for them to be honest but but who knows uh, who knows how that's going to change the team who knows if Rashford gets to play on the left rather than playing up front which he has done for the past two game weeks if he's moving moved out to the left then I'd be more inclined to keep him but just currently don't really have much faith in them I know they have a decent fixture against Nottingham Forest at home I say decent fixture because Nottingham Forest have been pretty good defensively so far so I don't think it's like a slam dunk really good match like it's not Sheffield United or Fulham or anything like that so so yeah I might just sell him just to get rid of him the fear with Rashford though is that he might get to play on the left now and then Hoyland comes in and they might look a lot better once they get a proper striker in in there and he also plays Arsenal gaming four which is usually a bad fixture but we know Rashford against Arsenal that's who he kind of made his breakthrough against way back in the day like five or six six years ago I think um and the team that he scored against last season as well so that is a tough game, but still, that's also a team that he has some really good experiences with or against in the past as well. So, so Rashford, don't really like the look of him, especially for 9.0, but he also has that threat of still being good, and he's so highly owned as well, so it's it's kind of tough to sell him. But but yeah, I think he looks worse out of him and Bruno Fernandes as well, so if I, have, if, I, if I had both, I would probably sell Rashford ahead of Fernandes, and I would probably keep Fernandes, but I might sell Rashford. Because Saka is someone that I'm not looking to sell, though, I, st I still think he is good value. I know he lost penalties, potentially. We don't really know yet. Martin Odegaard said that he asked to take the penalty, and he got it from Saka. So I think we have to assume that Odegaard is taking penalties from now on, because he scored, obviously, and he has been scoring penalties whenever he's had the chance of taking penalties. And you can't say the same about Saka. He has missed some, some pretty crucial penalties, as we all know. Uh, but even without penalties, I still think Saka is a really good, good option. I know people are bringing up now his expected numbers like his expected stats and stuff but that's always the case with Saka he always outperforms his expected goals and stuff so I wouldn't worry too much about the numbers because Saka is still going to produce even without that and even without penalties but, but yeah saying that compared to the other Arsenal assets maybe he's not the best out of the three maybe Odegaard is better but we don't really know what Odegaard yet and his role because he's playing like as a number eight sort of more than the number 10 that he played more like last season so so that might not be as good and Martinelli don't really know about rotation he hasn't really worked out so far this season he has had some decent like opportunities to get goals especially early on in, in the past game he was really open on the left but didn't really receive the ball in time so I think Martinelli especially now that Gabriel Jesus is back in training he might come really good as well like he's actually someone I was quite interested in after game week one so so yeah I think Martinelli is still again most most FL managers it seems like have Rashford, Fernandes, and Saka Martinelli as well. And personally, I would probably lean towards selling Rashford and Saka if I had to sell someone. And that's not what I said before the season. I actually had more faith in Saka and Rashford. But as of right now, maybe. But I think Arsenal, especially, playing Fulham at home, I think that's a much better fixture than Dream Forest at home. So anyone that has Saka, I, th I think you should keep him for sure. Even though I think potentially Martinelli might be slightly better and Odegaard might be slightly better than that again. So... So yeah, I think Arsenal players just keep them because Arsenal are a really good team. We can't really say the same about Man United. Then we have Ibrahim Essay, who once again blanked, and uh, it's, it's sad to see really because I had ho high hopes for him. He was one of my differentials. It's, it's a shame it didn't work out because because uh, yeah, he is someone that could have been someone like Mitoma, for example, which would have gotten me a lot more points at the start of the season. But 
At the same time, Eze has looked good. He had a tough fixture now against Arsenal. Tried to get a couple of penalties, but the, the referee didn't really bite. And uh, I think it was kind of correct as well. I think Eze was kind of looking to get fouled. And so, so, yeah, I don't think he deserved a penalty in that game, to be honest. But Eze, he looked really good in the first game against Sheffield United. So I still have faith in him, and I don't really see myself selling him for anyone else either. I have him Boyamo for 6.5. Diaby gets better fixtures in, like, game 8. And both Mito and March are really good players, and Brighton are a really good team, but they do have really tough fixtures coming up. So I think Eze is still potentially the second best 6.5 midfield option currently. So I'm going to just stick it out with Eze and hope that he turns good at some point because he is still the talisman for Crystal Palace. He is on penalties. He is on free kicks. So I think Eze eventually will come good. It's just someone that I just want to keep faith in because I know he's going to get points eventually in FPL. So, so yeah, I'm just going to keep him for now. I'm pretty sure about that. Then we have Mbemo, who is going nowhere. He's the best midfielder in the game currently, and if you don't have him already, I think you should buy him, especially if you have someone someone injured. If you're someone with uh, with uh, like a Madison, or if you got Mount for some reason at the start of the season, I think Mbemo is a really good replacement. Brentford have really good matches. You could even go with both him and Wissa. I wish I kind of did that from the start of the season as well myself, but either way, Mbemo is fantastic. He takes penalties. Scores really late goals. He gets to play striker when uh, Wissa gets subbed off or when they play with a 3-5-2 formation, which they did in game week one. So Mbuemo, just a no-brainer option in midfield. Then we have Holan who blanked, which is good for me because I didn't have him as captain. And I'm not really worried about Holan in the future either. He just played Newcastle, which is a tough team. He still had some decent chances to score. So no worries about Holan. Pretty happy that my compatriots decided to blank the one game week that I didn't captain him because for the next four or five game weeks I'm not cap captaining anyone else but Holland because Man City's fixtures are just so 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 good so so yeah Holland really thankful for him he's always been an MVP, MVP for me and uh, I hope it stays that way finally we have Joao Pedro who is a really interesting uh, player this week especially and it has changed a bit throughout the week as well but for the match in game week two for Brighton, he actually blanked and got zero points because he didn't start the match. He got subbed on and then got a yellow card and ended up with just zero points. The match was already won by the point that he came on uh, against, uh, it was against Wolves, right? Uh, and he didn't really contribute anything. But the thing is, Enciso or Enciso, who started that match, he seems to be out with a pretty serious injury now, which is probably, he's probably going to be out for like a month or two potentially. Um, so with that in mind, I uh, I think that uh, it's um, it's someone you have to re really think about if you want to keep him or sell him. Uh, it's, it's really a question of what you want to do with Joao Pedro, and I'm going to get to that when we come to the Game Week 3 um, possibilities uh, next. Uh, but yeah, in goal on the bench, I have Onana, two points for him. Plays Nottingham Forest at home in the next match, which should be decent for him. Uh, so I'm not looking to sell immediately, but I kind of wish I had a different goalkeeper because Man United haven't looked the best. And for 5.0, probably could get someone else for cheaper and still have someone in the bank to make some better transfers, potentially. On the, also on the bench, uh, as the first benched guy, we have Destiny Udogi, who got, however you say his name, he got five points. He got a clean sheet for Spurs. And uh, yeah, he got a yellow card as well, sadly. But he looks really good still and he's also one of the benching decisions potentially i'm gonna have to make in game week three as well i really like him then we have archer doesn't really play much for aston villa they have uh, john duran as the backup striker behind watkins but it seems like archer is now moving to sheffield united and he's going to be their starting striker and he has shown really really uh, good potential both in the under 21 euros for england and for middlesbrough i think it was middlesbrough last season in the championship so I think Archer for Sheffield United could be really good. So for 4.5, I feel like I have the best forward currently, unless Balogun moves to some other Premier League club. I still think Archer is the best 4.5 striker. And having like a decent 4.5 striker alternative uh, on top of the seven other really good assets you have in midfield and attack seems like a really good strategy because Archer could just step in whenever you have injuries. He could, could potentially score, but... It also doesn't feel that bad bench, benching him either, and he only costs 4.5, which is the least you can, or the least you have to spend for, or the least amount you you can spend for a forward NFL. Uh, badly worded that uh, sentence, but whatever. Uh, finally, we also have another really cheap for the cheapest possible player, and that is uh, Isaka Bore on the bench. He 
didn't have a good fixture in game week two. Don't really know what to make of Luton so far because they played Brighton in game week one and we saw that Brighton against Wolves. They're just going to destroy pretty much every team. So don't really have a good read on Luton. Maybe Luton are better than, than we expect. Maybe especially at home, they could be a lot better uh, than we expect currently after seeing them concede four goals against Brighton and before that having very little faith in Luton in general because they made it for the first time in, in what is it, 30 years to the top division. And uh, and yeah, they weren't really the best side in the championship last season either. They finished third after all. But, but yeah, Isako Borre looked really good in gimmick one. And uh, yeah, I feel pretty good about having him going forward as well. But I kind of wish I had Malagusto that I just did the punt on Malagusto and hope, or hope, not hope, but uh, just uh, just bet on Reese James getting injured at some point because Gusto is going to play every game when, when James doesn't play. Didn't result in any points for Gusto in gimmick one, but... But still, that could potentially get some points eventually. But yeah, moving on to my game week three plans. This is my current team, and I have first before we go on to the transfers or the potential transfers that I might make. Uh, we have some benching decisions, and mainly, it is Destiny Odogi for against Bournemouth away. I have benched him, but I might bench Saliba against Fulham. Don't really feel good about that though, because I think he's going to keep a clean sheet. Obviously, I can't bench. I can bench actually an attacking player, so potentially I could bench SA as well, plays Brentford away, which is kind of a tough fixture, but I feel like that match could also be um, a match where we get goals both ways, so, so yeah, I'm not 100% sure about that either, but Udogi could potentially come in for, for SA most likely if I stay with this same team, or potentially if I make transfers, I'm, yeah, I might do that as well. Um, but yeah, I really like Udogi's attacking potential, but at the same time, I think Bournemouth are going to score, and I'm not 100% sure that Spurs and especially Udogi can get attacking returns either against Bournemouth. So currently, I feel pretty good about Saliba and Eze as my starters over Udogi, but that might change come the gaming three deadline. Then that's pretty much the only benching decision I have to make or benching headache. Archer is still with Aston Villa, not going to play for me and Kabore against Chelsea away not gonna happen compared to the players that I have currently in my squad and since I made no transfers last week I have two free transfers and uh, I was pretty set on what to do earlier in the week because uh, I felt like I, I had to get rid of Joe Pedro after he didn't play in game week two and it looked like Enchiso was going to play from now on potentially but now with the r news or rumors at least I think there are pretty it's more than rumors at this point. It, it is pretty much confirmed that he has some sort of knee issue, uh, Julio and Ciso. So that seems to open up playing time for Joao Pedro as well. But at the same time, one of the reasons I wanted to sell Joao Pedro is the fact that they have pretty tough fixtures, Brighton do eventually. And also the fact that I really want one of the new strikers that are really interesting currently for Game Week 3 and beyond. And mainly for me, it has been between Nick Jackson and Alvarez and earlier in the week before price changes, I could have done Rashford to Foden and then have enough for Pedro to Jackson. But seeing as both Foden has risen in price and Jackson has risen in price, that is no longer a possibility, but I could still get Foden in for Rashford and then get Julian Alvarez in for Joao Pedro. And that's currently what I'm looking towards doing. Um, like I said previously, did have some plans potentially about selling Salah in Game Week Three to open up some some uh, cap space, or uh, as we say in uh, as they say in the US. Um, but yeah, have some money in the bank. But at the same time, when I sell Salah in my team and I have like four million to spend in the bank, I don't really know what to spend it on. Like I could potentially upgrade Archer to one of these these guys and have eight fantastic attackers and just have Joe Pedro on the bench most game weeks. And have him as like a nice backup option if in case of injuries or like early team use or something like that so i could potentially do that but other than up upgrading archer to like a starting striker and having a benching headache every week offensively as well as defensively because udogi is going to be someone you want to play going forward as well other than that i don't really see much use of the extra funds because like the bruyne is injured for until the new year son is not looking that good um, any other expensive players? Trent Alexander-Arnold is not looking good at all either. Liverpool are conceding goals for fun still, and he hasn't really performed as well as he did towards the end of last season as well. So there's not really much to use the money on. And I think if Salah was 8.5 or 9.0, everyone would have him surely because Salah is he's still Salah. I've seen so many people say that oh he's not the same. He's playing too far wide. Blah 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 blah. He might not be on pens because he missed a pen. He 
firstly, I think he's going to just stay on Pence because I think he is the type of player that is not going to give that up, even though they have really good penalty takers, better better penalty takers than Salah currently in their team, and McAllister and Soboslai. I think Salah is one of those guys that just wants, because he, he really likes to go for that uh, Golden Booth, uh, Golden Booth, Golden Boot trophy. Um as well, even though that's a tall order with Holland in the league. But, but yeah, I think Salah is just going to stay on Pence. I think Klopp also thinks that I don't want to upset my, my main player that much. He he does bench him from time to or sub him off from time to time and make him sort of pissed. But I don't think he wants to take him off penalties permanently. So unless Salah steps down willingly, which I don't think he's going to do, I think he's still going to be on Pence. And like he showed now this past game week, even if he misses the pen, he could still score the rebound. So penalties are just always whether you have a bad penalty taker or a good penalty taker it's pretty much always a plus to have a penalty taker so so yeah i don't buy into the fact that like oh watkins probably is a better player because he lost pens no way you have to miss like two out of three pens basically to to pretty much almost break even when it comes to like penalties in terms of points uh so yeah that's the one thing salah i still think he's going to be on pens and secondly they do have a tough fixture against Newcastle, but after that, they have some decent fixtures. Aston Villa at home, which is not the worst. I mean, they could score goals. Aston Villa have looked... They looked really leaky against uh, Liverpool, so that could be a, a pretty good game. Then they have Wolves away, and Wolves as well, showed against Brighton. They can concede a lot of goals. And then they have West Ham at home in the fixture after that. And that, once again, is a fixture that Salah is, is usually doing really well in. So, so yeah, I think Salah... If he was 8.5 or 9.0, everyone would have him. And the formula in extra that I save from selling Salah to get another like 8.5 or below, or a 9.0 or below midfielder, I don't really feel like I could use that money at all either. So, so yeah, I, I would rather have Salah than having money in the bank uh, for me. So, so yeah. But yeah, for now, my transfers are most likely going to be Rashford and Joao Pedro out. I most likely want to get rid of the, those guys in game week four and beyond anyway the only worry is game week uh, three because Rashford has Nottingham Forest at home which is a good fixture Joe Pedro has West Ham at home and Brighton always destroy West Ham and if Joe Pedro starts and is on penalties it's probably going to be a pretty profitable game for for Joe Pedro so <laughs> it does not feel good about feel good selling Rashford and Joe Pedro this week but at the same time you got to look at the upside, and that is getting the Man City players in, because they have Sheffield United and Fulham in the next two matches. And I know they are signing Jeremy Doku, they are pro- potentially signing Matheus Nunez, or potentially even Essay, who I already have in the team, uh, so that would be quite handy. I potentially could get four City players, if, if that's the case. Uh, but even if they do make signings, that they're not going to be integrated into the squad until after Game Week 4, most likely. Especially Game Week 3, both Foden and Alvarez most likely will start. I know Bernardo Silva is coming back from injury, but the way Foden looked last game and, and the way Alvarez has been played pretty much every single game when De Bruyne has been missing, I feel pretty good about bo- both of those players playing at least Game Week 3, most likely Game Week 4. Then after that, maybe it's going to be more of like a... Um, a minutes risk for them especially if if city actually do sign some players which it looks likely that they will do uh, but still at the same time game week five against west ham maybe maybe you try to bench one of them maybe at that point i have enough money in the bank to have like a good eighth attacker and i can bench whoever i feel like is the most at risk of being benched uh, but still that's not the worst uh, fixture either against west ham and then the following week when they play nottingham forest at home which is another really good fixture to target they actually play in the earliest match of the game week, so we'll actually get team news at that point if Foden or Alvarez or both are starting that match. So if one of them is not starting in game week, what is it, game week six against uh, Wolverhampton, then I could sell one of them, the the one that is, is benched. But until then, they have three really good fixtures, especially the first two, where they're most likely going to play, and Man City could very easily score five or six goals and most people will not have a single city attacking asset apart from Holland unless they go for Foden or Alvarez at this point in time. So, so yeah, I think that's a pretty good strategy, but I'm still not 100% sure about it. If I don't do these transfers, I do have free, two free transfers. I want to keep Salah. I kind of want to get rid of Rashford regardless, to be honest. So I might, I might just stick to only Rashford to Foden and see if I can save up some money maybe jackson looks really good nick jackson looks really good for for chelsea against luton and maybe i really want to have him in year four rather than going with alvarez 
So maybe I'll just do the Rashford to Foden thing and just stick with Joe Pedro against West Ham for now and switch him out next week and potentially get some more money in some other way and buy Nick Jackson next week rather than Alvarez. That's also an, an option that I have, but most likely I'm doing Rashford to Foden and I think I'd say I'm about like 60, 40 or 70, 30 even going to do the Joe Pedro to Alvarez move as well because I really like Alvarez and I have been sort of bigging him up on uh, Twitter and stuff. So I feel like I'm sort of I sort of have to go with him, and also I feel like with Foden and Alvarez in the team, there's a good chance or a decent chance at least that both of them are really good. If Man City win like four or five six nil, good chance that both of them are really good at the same time. I think it's like highly likely that at least one of them will be really good going forward, and I think it's very not such a big possibility it's not a big possibility at all that both of them flop like i can't really see that happening so i feel like both those getting both of those guys in it's sort of like a fail safe you can't it can't really fail 100 percent, and it could potentially be really explosive and, and really good and uh, if you go with someone like chelsea if like, i could potentially do rashford to sterling and joe pedro to to jackson if i had a lot of faith in chelsea because they have really good fixtures but you don't really know if Chelsea are going to be good. Like they just lost three one against West Ham, uh, so so yeah. So yeah, with Foden and Alvarez, why not both? Uh, <laughs> that's pretty much my question. The the old meme, ¿Por qué no los dos? Uh, so yeah, I feel like having both is pretty much a fail safe. It could go really well. It could probably not go badly at all, like super badly, and potentially you get one of them being a major hit, and that's going to be fair enough especially having Man City in this greatest fixture run of all time, probably, <laughs> uh, at least for this season. I don't think they're going to have a better fixture run than they are at this point in time. So, so yeah, I feel pretty strongly about those two guys. But anyways, that is it for me in this video. Those are my thoughts for the team section for Gaming 3. I can't really foresee any other transfers than the ones I've talked about potentially doing. If, if I'm really boring, I could do like... Uh, yeah, I'm not going to sell Onana either because he plays Nottingham Forest this game week. Um, I could do something like Turnitorial or something if I can't find any of the transfers and I want to keep Rashford and Joe Pedro for some reason. Maybe do, I don't know, like, maybe Kabori to Gusto. Like, I don't know, it's so boring. I, I want to kind of attack this season and try to be on the front foot and try to gain more and more of an advantage than I already have so far in the season. So, so yeah, keeping Salah is one of those uh, options and having triple city attack for this fantastic fixture run is is the other. So so yeah, captaincy, hold on, obviously. So don't really have to talk about that. Saka's vice captain, he's really good at home. Usually Fulham at home is going to be a really good fixture for Arsenal. So I think Martinelli is actually a really good player for this game as well, especially if Gabriel Jesus is back. So, so yeah, keep an eye out for that. But that's it for me. See you and goodbye.